and welcome to a community conversation hosted by um, United Ways, Women United. For those of you who may be new here, um, Women United is a community um, engagement group of United Way um, made up of women leaders here in Chattanooga who collaborate to support United Way and the community. Um, Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation around fostering an equitable, diverse, and inclusive community. Um, guiding us through this conversation today is Dion Jenkins, who is the Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion at TVFCU. Um, Dion has over three years of experience leading these types of conversations um, and is also a community advocate and volunteer, and we appreciate her time um, and attention today to this topic. Um, joining Dion is Tony Doily, who is the Director of Workforce Engagement with United Way. We also have Dominique Brandt, who is the Vice President of Community Impact. And last, we have Tagora Johnson, who is the Interim CEO of Girls Inc. Um, we thank you guys so much for being here today um, and helping us talk about this subject today. Um, we titled this event a community conversation because we want it to be just that your voice is welcomed here um, and we wanted to provide a safe place for you guys to join in on the conversation and ask questions however if you don't want to talk you are welcome to drop those questions into the chat and either dion or i will address those on your behalf so with that dion i'm going to turn it over to you thank you hannah i appreciate it I am so excited to be on this call today with this group of amazing leaders who are doing such great work in our community. As Hannah said, I've been doing diversity and inclusion for the credit union for the last three years, but um, outside of the credit union, this is just my life. This is the life that I live. This is what I have done every day um, in, in, for my lifetime. And so one thing that I do know about this is when you talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, the conversations can be very uncomfortable. And I want you all to know that today is a day about just being open, honest, and discussing how we can be diverse, equitable, and inclusive in our community and what some of our organizations are doing um, in that space. There are so many of us working in this line um, and DEI, it really has a different meaning for every individual and every organization. But the overall goal in this work is to make sure that we create opportunities for everyone, to make sure everyone feels included, that we create a space where everyone has a voice and has opportunity. So with that, um, I, I, what, I, what I wanna say is our goal today is not to promote one agenda, it's not to promote any lifestyles, but it really is about education and it's about just discussing what we can do uh, in our collective roles to make sure that Chattanooga is just the best place for all of us to work, live, and play. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna kind of kick off this first question and Dominique, I'm gonna address it to you because this is a Women United call um, through United Way. And my question to you is, in, in your, your opinion, what does diversity, equity, and inclusion mean for your organization or for the organizations that United Way serves? Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be on here. Uh, very honored to be part of this panel. And Dion, thank you for your very capable uh, facilitation of this event and this conversation. Um, you know, with everything that has been occurring in the last few months in our country, um, but even going before that, diversity, equity, and inclusion is key and one of the core values that United Way has always had in place the concept of equity of who we're serving and um, who we are including in the work and in the leadership that has been key to the work that United Way has been doing all along. And so for us in this uh, heightened time of awareness, what it's really meant is primarily, first of all, listening. Um, we are so aware of what we don't know. Um, so we are listening very closely to our community. 
we have started doing some um, facilitated training for all of our staff that is, uh, to your point, a little bit uncomfortable because the conversations are tough and we are blessed that our staff is diverse. Um, so there's a lot of sensitivity on, on all sides of what this conversation looks like. Um, but that is the, the biggest thing that we're doing. We are educating ourselves and we are listening because one of the things that we have discovered is that before we actually take action, we've got to have a much clearer and deeper understanding of everything that is involved. Um, sometimes we think we know a lot and what we don't know is way more than what we think we know. Right, absolutely. Dominique, you bring up a great point because one of the things that we wanna make sure that organizations are thinking about is what does diversity mean for your organization? But, so you have to define it. So when, 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 you, when you create a blanket statement that says something like, we, we want to be more diverse, well, what does that mean? Are you trying to be racially diverse? Are you looking at gender diversity? Are you looking at socioeconomic or the products and services? And so defining diversity for your organization is important. Um, and because I, 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 I'll use this example, I serve on several boards um, within the community. And when they set a goal that says we wanna be more diverse, I wanna know what that means so that at the end of the year, when we go back and look at those goals, we can say, yes, we hit that goal. So if you say we want to um, have more racial diversity, define that. Are you trying to bring in more from the Latinx community, from the African-American community? It's important to define not only the racial diversity you wanna see, but by how much? So what does it mean to your organization? And don't just say, I wanna increase racial diversity for the, the sake of just bringing in more faces of color. When you bring in individuals of color, you have to make sure that you're utilizing the expert expertise that they're bringing to the table, not to just say we increased the racial diversity in our organization, but then you don't utilize the benefits that they are bringing along with that race. So um, I, I appreciated your, your comment, Dominique, and that helped me think of that. To Cora, I'm gonna throw this question to you um, because we, we understand kind of what Girls Inc. is doing um, in terms of girls, but what impact does diversity, equity, and inclusion have on young women of color? Um, I think it's the representation. Um, I believe that every day we strive and, and emulate to pick career paths, entrepreneurship opportunities when we see individuals that look like us. So, um, you know, just not in STEM, but in everything, like I said, from entrepreneurship to being a principal of a high school or being the CEO of Girls Inc. Um, when you look at the population of girls that we serve, it is very important to us that our team, our board, and our volunteers um, are a fair representation of the families and the girls that we serve in our in-school, after-school, and seasonal camp programs. Right, absolutely. I appreciate that. And Tony, I want to make sure I get you in on this conversation um, because I know you do a lot with different organizations within the community. And so what does diversity, equity, and inclusion mean for the organizations that you work with? Yes. Uh, so a lot of the companies that, that, that we are working with on the campaign trail or whether me personally working with them, one of the things that I hear often is they want to learn from the perspective from, of, of somebody that may be different from them. Um, and, and, and obviously, whether that's a Caucasian male, Caucasian female, Latin, whatever the case may be, I think them seeing somebody in a position of influence um, gives them the ability to be able to decipher and learn more about that person or that culture, um, even if it's just for a professional reason. Um, because obviously, though my background is different from somebody else that looks different from me in a professional setting, um, because, I, because I understand a professional setting and how to conduct myself, 
I have learned that many people, if, if that professional approach is taken, then they're more apt and more willing to hear what I have to say, though I may look different from them. So in a corporate setting, that's one of the things that we are seeing, um, especially just obviously in the past few months, just because of what's going on. I think um, the minority voice is more amplified, but it's actually even more valued because of the professionalism, you know, because of the approach that's taken. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I, I know for me, I, like, like we talked about, I've been in this role for three years. And when I took the role in 2017, someone asked me, they said, um, so what are you going to do when diversity and inclusion is no, no longer the buzzwords, no longer top of mind? And, you know, I had to really reflect back and, and think. And honestly, I would love it if this role went away. I would love it if we could stop talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion and actually live it. Um, but we're not there yet, unfortunately. In, in 2020, we're not there. And it's important that we have these conversations and that as, as many of our panelists have talked about, that people are willing to listen. You have to listen to what those around you are saying. You have to listen to the voices of your constituents. Um, for us at the credit union, we're listening to what our employees have to say and our members as well because that's the only way that we'll be able to serve our community if we understand what the needs are. Um, one of my mentors gave me advice when I took on this role and what he said was, Dion, don't walk in with a plan. Don't walk in saying, okay, this is what diversity means for this organization and this is how we're gonna fix it. You have to learn the culture first. Understand what people are bringing to the organization already understand the culture within the organization and then devise a plan that works for that particular organization. And I'm sure Takora, with you, you're probably learning that uh, in this role, you've been with Girls Inc. a long time, but for the CEOs that came before you, you have to create a style that works for you and the organization and making sure that that, that culture that you create is something that everyone feels like they can be a part of, right? And so for those of you listening, no, I, I see you've turned your, your mic on, please speak to that. No, I was just agreeing, yes, that is, um, that is correct. I have uh, been with Girls Inc. for 10 years, so I've um, worked under two previous presidents and CEOs, and that has always been uh, one of the focuses, um, not only establishing a culture, but maintaining a culture and also uh, being flexible. So knowing that different times calls for different measures and um, having to have tough conversations. And again, with Girls Inc., our conversation um, doesn't just start and stop with race, but it also um, includes gender. Uh, we do have individuals that um, inquire on why we believe that all girl programming is beneficial and impactful um, for girls and how do we work to engage um, girls with their peers um, in the male cohort. So, um, yeah, Absolutely. totally agree. Yes. So, Tony, you kind of touched base on this about where we are in our nation and, and just kind of the racial tensions that we've seen over the last few months. And how do you think Chattanooga has handled those conversations? Um, and are we doing enough as a community? I know that's a tough question. And I know for uh, anyone that's not on the panel that would like to comment on any of these questions, please, as we said, this is a conversation, jump in or put something in the chat and we will make sure we address that. But Tony, will you take a stab at that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, it is an extremely tough question an extremely tough conversation. Um, I want to believe that we are trending in the right direction um, nationally as well as locally. Um, I am just me personally, I am a little concerned with um, things getting brushed under the rug too quickly, um, hoping that it will just pass. Um, you know, I've heard that a lot uh, where folks are wanting, hey, you know, can we just move on from this already? And unfortunately, we can't, um, you know, not not to bring up something 
that has happened in our past. Um, because obviously we don't live in our past. We live in our present and prepare for our future. Um, but unfortunately, it's hard to prepare for our future and to live the way we need to live in our present if we don't understand and get some clarity and some healing from the past. Um, and so, and, and, and um, to Cora's point, it's not just, you know, uh, African-Americans, um, you know, you know, obviously there was a women's suffrage. There is, there is um, um, Latin people, you know, that have been, you know, mistreated as well. And so when you have all these different factors and not all of the portion of the population that, that was responsible for it, but you have people in our society that, that still have the mentality of what took place in the past, there's a lot of tension there. Um, and here in this community, we do see that very often, um, whether it's through improper policing, whether it's through somebody may look suspicious, but they're really not suspicious, but they're suspicious because they look like somebody that actually did commit a crime. Um, I do feel like, that, again, I want to be hopeful that there is growth, um, but I also know that in order for us to truly see the growth that we need to see as a society, both locally and nationally, um, is these types of conversations. Um, I do feel like um, our current police administration has helped with that. You know, knowing Chief Roddy the way I do, I know his passion and his heart to try to have these conversations. That's helpful. Um, you know, one of the things I have heard from many folks here that live in this community is that distrust of police. So having a chief, having police officers that are willing to go and speak to young kids, to speak more, more importantly to teenage boys and girls in our community, to let them know, hey, you don't have to be, you know, fearful of who I am because I have a badge, but also to making sure that we are doing proper training for those who are in those in those positions of authority so that they understand and know how to police people that may look different from them. Um, so all in all, I would say I'm hopeful, um, you know, but I do know we have a long way to go and these conversations help move that needle along. You, you bring up some really great points. Um, I really appreciate what you said about, um, oh, at old age guys, uh, <laughs> it hit me. But the, the community policing piece is important uh, to make sure that our children understand not to be fearful of the police, that they're there to help them, um, especially in tough situations, but also educating those departments to make sure that they're building relationships um, with individuals. Um, but also your point about not living in the past, but it's important that we understand what happened in the past because that's the only way that we'll be able to move forward. And if we keep sweeping it under the rug and pretending as though it didn't happen or we need to move forward, we'll never grow as individuals or a community. And being an outsider, I think that's something that I see a lot in Chattanooga. And when you talk about the tale of two cities and you see it, and the only way that we can really come together as one community is to understand both sides and both perspectives and be willing to talk about it and, and not just create initiatives that just last momentarily, but create true sustainable opportunities for growth and advancement for everybody. Um, Dominique, I'm gonna kind of throw that tough question at you also, because I know you've come from um, other organ other communities. So you've kind of seen it in Florida and seen it here. How do you think we're handling it um, here in Chattanooga and any, any opportunities for us to grow in advance? Uh, yeah, thanks for that, Dion. Um, so, so I am from South Florida originally. And um, one of the things I talk about a lot coming from Miami is that in Miami, we have a lot of racial challenges, black and white, um, but the Latinx community does not experience um, the same prejudices and discrimination that they do in other parts of the country. It's a very isolated 
uh, area in the in the Miami uh, Day County and Broward area. Um, but coming to Chattanooga, that was an eye opening situation for me because I had never experienced that as as a woman of of Hispanic or or Latin origin, and I found that here I did that there was a oh you're Latin and there was this expectation that there were certain things about my life that had been a certain way. And it turned out that in my case, none of them were true. So I experienced for the first time um, prejudice, I, I, maybe not discrimination, but definitely prejudice. But I know that many of our, our Latinx uh, community do experience discrimination here because of that. Um, so that's a real challenge. Um, and I think one of the things that we've, we've talked about already is that unless you are able to kind of go back for a moment in history, you really can't move forward. So if, if you don't know the history, you're destined to repeat it. So we need to have that understanding. But we also need to understand that this is not a conversation for a day, a week, a month, or even a year. We did not get to this place in the United States overnight. This has been a lengthy process and, and again the more I learn about some of the historical things that have occurred that have allowed systemic prejudice and discrimination to to really be in place firmly in our country I recognize more and more that this is not something that we're going to turn around overnight but we have to have that commitment to having those really uncomfortable conversations um, in, in spaces like this um, in our places of work um, in our places of worship, in our groups of friends, we can no longer keep saying that things like race and prejudice and discrimination are not socially acceptable, quote unquote, topics to have those conversations. We all need to get to that point where we are comfortable with the discomfort. Um, overall, I think Chattanooga has taken a really great step forward but I sort of echo Tony with the, I'm kind of hearing people being a little nervous, like, okay, so when are we going to be kind of done with that? And the answer to that is we're not going to be done for a really long time until you and, and all of your cohort that have your position, Dion, are out of a job, we will not be done. I agree. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, you, you bring up an interesting point about not being able to turn things around overnight. And when I took this role, uh, or before I accepted the role, I had a conversation with our CEO. And I said, listen, what I need you to understand is you all had an 81 year head start over me. Don't expect me to come in and turn things around overnight. Because I have 81 years of policies, procedures, mindsets that not only do I have to learn and understand, but trying to change a mindset or look at a policy from a different perspective and then getting others on board is going to be difficult. And so if you're expecting immediate turnover or you're expecting within three to six months to evaluate me and say, yeah, okay, you're, you're making ground, you're making progress, then I'm not ready for this role and I don't think you are either. And he said, no, I understand that. And I appreciate you being open enough to say, it's going to take me a while. I won't make that change immediately. And I'll tell you, I'm in year three in this role and I feel like I'm just scratching the surface. Because when you talk about diversity, equity and inclusion, and what I find most is just that word diversity alone creates this buzz that puts everybody in a tizzy. Everyone's in a frenzy. And they, what, what, what does that mean? And so that's why I said you have to define diversity in the beginning and what you're looking at because I could see in this role that for those that didn't understand the work of DEI, their first thought was, oh, she's setting out to only help our black employees and to only hire black employees. And that wasn't my role at all. So defining for them what the strategy was coming in and how it would impact the organization in creating a business case for diversity in the workplace was important. But we are having uncomfortable conversations. We're at, at, at TVFCU, 
we're doing a series and the theme is uncomfortable conversations and then each meeting has a different topic that we focus on and so even in this work i can't say that every time i log into a call to talk about dei that i'm just super confident and i'm not worried about offending anyone or like this is my thing i got it no i'm always worried about uh am, is everyone feeling included in the conversation does anyone feel singled out um, in a bad way? And so making sure that everyone has, has a piece um, in the conversation and know that we're there to, to create change for all. And you also brought up a point of, you know, we all remember the time where it was, you didn't talk about race in the workplace. You didn't talk about politics in the workplace. You didn't talk about religion in the workplace, but with social media, and with everything being at our fingertips 24 hours a day, we actually have to have these conversations now. We can't pretend like it's not happening because, Tony, I don't want to speak for you, but I can imagine that every time a Black man is shot and you go into work that day, you're not at 100%. That's on your mind. And so understanding as organizations that when these things are happening in these communities, it impacts our coworkers. And yes, they are coming in to do a job, but we also have to have some empathy and understand that when that happens, we're not at our best. We're not at our 100%. Dominique, do you have a, a comment? I, I did, I had a thought and, um what you just mentioned to Tony was kind of where I was going. Um, you had talked about um, wanting to make sure that you're not like offending anybody and that nobody feels marginalized. And what I just wanted to share, again, stuff that I'm learning that I, I don't know that I always was aware of, but everybody comes to this with a different lens. So our, our black brothers and sisters have had trauma, they've had historical trauma. Every time they have these conversations, there is a re-traumatization of, of them. Those that are white often have survivor's guilt because they feel like, okay, how did I not realize this? Or what did I do? Or what haven't I done? Or how do I make up for that? So there's all kinds of different feelings that they're having. Um, the Latinx community has a whole different experience that bring, they bring that lens to the table. So we all have to be really sensitive because on every side, there, is, there are a lot of challenges. Um, and that, that would be the one first thing that I was thinking. And then the second thing I was thinking is that it really is on the, those that are not been discriminated historically, so not the Blacks, or African Americans, but not all Blacks are African Americans. So I'm going to say Black because not all Blacks are African American, um, and the the Latinx community. So those that don't fit into those molds, the burden is on them or on us to really learn. Let us not burden on top of the burden that we've already placed on our Black brothers and sisters in our Latinx community that they have to be teaching us. The burden is on us to learn. Absolutely. Um, that is such a great point because oftentimes when we do these talks, I might have someone that'll grab me afterwards and say, if you ever see me doing that, let me know. And it's not my job to let you know. You have to learn to be self-aware. And, you know, when I, what I tell people is there wasn't a manual for me that said, this is how you treat white people when you encounter them. This is how you treat... And so you treat everyone as a human, you treat them all with kindness, with dignity, with respect, and then no one has to tell you if you've done something wrong or acted in a certain way, because just because I walk in the room doesn't mean the conversation should shift, right? If you're about to tell a joke in a room, if you have to look around the room to see who's in the room, don't tell the joke, because it's offensive. And you, you have to start being aware of those things that you do that you, you may not even, if you're unconscious bias, right? And so understanding that if I'm looking around before I say something, or if someone that looks different from me walks into a room and I have to shift my whole conversation, 
you need to internalize and start realizing some of the, some of the things that you do that you may want to change. Tiny, Tony, do you want to chime in on this discussion? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I was just going to add, um, advocacy is so important. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we talk a lot about being child advocates. You know, when children are hurting or broken or in pain, make sure that there's, you know, teachers are advocates, principals, et cetera. Um, but those, those who are considered the minority, when they have, when, when, when we have advocates that are of the majority, it empowers us. Um, you know, in terms of not looking for a crutch or a handout, that's different. But I think knowing that somebody that is considered more powerful, seeing the potential or seeing the growth or seeing the ability of a person that is considered less powerful and saying, I'm going to speak up on your behalf. Even we, especially when you're not in the room, especially when you may be looking for something or looking for a, you know, a next level, whether it's a promotion or a job increase, or whatever the case may be. And you have the ability to speak up for that person that may be less fortunate or, or viewed as less than for you to be able to say, look, I'm going to advocate for that person because I know their ability. You know, it's, it's, it's very easy to judge somebody based off of how they look as opposed to judging them based off of their character, based off of their integrity, based off of their ability to accomplish something. So I think overall, when we take that viewpoint, when we take that standard of living, then I think we are truly advocating for everybody. Um, because when we do that, we are empowering instead of taking the power away from somebody. Absolutely. Think of it in terms of a bully on a playground. If, if there's a bully picking on one kid or there are a group of kids picking on one kid that's more vulnerable, you can't just stand back and say, oh, look, they're picking on that kid. You need to step in. And what I share with our staff is if you see something, say something. And we have a, a, a way where if you're not comfortable with approaching someone directly and saying, you know, I really didn't appreciate what you said to that member or how you talked to our, our coworker, we have a, a hotline where people can report bad behavior without identifying who they are. But there has to be a way for people to step up. And not everyone is bold enough to approach the bully and say, you're a bully, cut it out. But in an organization, you have to make sure that your staff members understand that there is somewhere they can go to and have a conversation and say, hey, this isn't right. How do we change this? This is what's happening. Um, to Cora, when you talk about girls and, and what you all do at Girls Inc., how do you all empower the girls to step up and be bold and, and, and take up for themselves, but also take up for others? Um, well, I think what's important for us working with youth and particularly girls um, is one is we do teach them the history. We believe that when an individual knows the history, they are more appreciative of the present and even more um, open to making changes for the future. So character development is very, very important for us. We teach um, our girls that character counts. And so we're not the male bashing organization. So we're not out there saying like girls rule, boys suck or anything of that nature. But we're just teaching them that, like you said earlier, it's about being a human being first. Um, and so through our social and emotional activities, our engagement with guest speakers and volunteers, um, it is our goal to empower our girls to do such things. So our teens have uh, many opportunities to advocate on behalf of teen related issues. And this semester we're implementing um, a national curriculum um, titled She Votes and it's teaching our girls about advocacy and the um, political um, process. But most importantly, we are teaching our girls how to advocate for themselves, um, not only um, in the home or at Girls Inc, but also in their school. So um, we asked the girl, like if we review a report card um, and there's like a D or F in math. So we asked the question, like, have you talked to your teacher about this? And they'll, they will give you 
lots of reasons why they have not. So we take that opportunity to give them different strategies. So I understand you may not want to raise your hand in class because you don't understand. I understand that you may not want to stay after class and now everyone sees you and you're gonna be talking to the teacher. So we support them in other ways. So we have our girls write letters to their teachers um, informing their teachers that they need additional help or we work with our parents to, pre to prepare for those parent conferences or we will attend those uh, parent-teacher conferences with them. So again, I think we have the unique opportunity with them being our youth and um, the future is starting with advocacy now. Uh, we have girls who in the fifth grade last year talked about how the um, nurse's office at their school was not, um, it didn't draw you in. It never made you want to go in if you were struggling with anything um, health-wise. And there was a young lady who um, started her menstrual cycle and went the entire day without telling anyone until she got to Girls Inc. And by the time she arrived to us, I mean, she, it was a mess. It was, it was everywhere. And we talked to her about, you know, did you not feel comfortable going to the nurse's station? And it was just like, you know, when I go in, everyone's going to know because when I come out, they're going to give me this particular bag and all the boys know that what's in this bag. And I just don't feel um, like it's not exciting when you go in there. It's very sterile. So they were thinking of ways how to partner with uh, the nurses um, at different schools um, to just kind of make that, that part of what the school offers just a little bit more exciting. So yes, our girls as early as six, we are teaching them how to advocate for themselves. But most importantly, we begin everything with teaching them about character. Absolutely. Great, great story. Thank you for sharing that. And so as, as leaders and within our organizations, we have to create a climate where our employees feel comfortable. We have to have um, an opportunity for them to step up and talk about um, what's not working well in their department or, or what's not working well for the constituents that they serve. And, and so at, in your respective organizations, just kind of look at your policies and procedures and think about where you can make change and think about who people can go to and make sure they know that make sure that there's a place where they can talk about what's happening um, uh, uh, and what's not working well. Um, one of the things that uh, I wanted to talk about is having these conversations within the workplace, because we, we have talked about it being uncomfortable and how do you have those conversations and what should you do or should not do um, and one, one point that I, I want to bring up and it, it's kind of a uh, about this, these uncomfortable conversations, because it's a topic that came up in one of our internal surveys that we did. Um, but the, the, the phrase of, I don't see color. And I want you to know when you say, I don't see color, what I hear is you don't see me because I am a woman of color. And so take that out of your vocabulary. And, and kids get together and they play and they really don't see color. They just see their friends, but as, a, as an adult, I see color. When you get dressed every day, you see color. Uh, I never see professionals walk in with an orange blazer, a pink shirt, green pants, and bright yellow shoes. So you see color. Now, what you, you're saying is, I don't want to address your color. That's what you're saying to us is I don't want to, it makes me uncomfortable to say that you're black. Why? Because I say it every day. I am a black woman. I want to be seen as a black woman. So when, when you think about just statements and blanket statements that you make, let's make sure that we take that, um, take that out of your, out of your vocabulary. Just, I, you see color. I see you but you, I, I'd much rather say, I don't look at you based on your color, I look at your heart. And that's something that I, I share with people is when they say, well, how do I know if they're being sincere? How do I know? Listen to their heart. And because even in the words that they say, you can say something to me. You can say, oh, I celebrate the LGBTQ community, 
But then I look around and I see all the members of the LGBTQ community sitting over there and you haven't engaged with them at all. And so you might be saying that I celebrate them and I embrace them, but then you don't talk to them and you don't get engaged and you don't want to learn more. Um, education is key in this discussion. And what I tell our employees is when you don't know something, you have it at your fingertips. The answer is right there. I don't mind people coming to me and asking me questions. Um, I appreciate it because I want the opportunity to educate you. But, you know, what, what, I, what I always share in our training at work is, you know, back in my day, if you wanted to know something, when you went to the librarian, what did they tell you? Look it up in the card catalog. Learn your Dewey Decimal System, right? And that's how you were educated. Now I can just ask Siri and she'll tell me things that I wanna know. So when people say, oh, I didn't know, that's unacceptable because you can find the answer. You can have conversations with people. Uh, folks ask me all the time, you know, when, when I meet people uh, and, and they wanna talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, how do you get the conversation started? And if you've ever heard me talk before, you've probably heard me say this a million times, but start with hello. Start with hi. If you walk into a room, especially as a leader of an organization, if you walk into your organization every day and you only speak to one or two people in that organization, you're creating a hostile work environment. You're creating an environment where your employees don't feel like they can come to you because you don't even take the time just to say hello. So I encourage all of our managers, speak to everybody in your department. Because when we get complaints of, well, that's their favorite person, or this is their favorite person, and then the manager says, why do they think that's my favorite person? Well, that's who you talk to every single day. You walk in, you go to that desk, and you say hello to that person every day, and the rest of your group feels excluded. Same with uh, folks that are working from home. I'm working from home, have been since March, and it's important for managers who are working from home to reach out to their teams and make them still feel included. So we send out group emails and everything. And so I might see an email that says the refrigerator on my floor is being cleaned out that day. I don't really care about that, but I do want to know that there's a new policy that's been implemented. I do want to know that there are some changes happen within the organization. So that's the inclusion piece of it. Um, but in talking about workforce diversity and equity within an organization, Tony, do, will you share, are there, how do you all talk about equity within your organization or, or inclusion within the organization? Yeah, you know, uh, especially the, these past six, seven months, um, we've had several conversations around making sure that we're celebrating everybody. Um, and, and, and also allowing for dialogue, not just a one blanket statement or a written statement that was made from our marketing department and we just move on. Um, our, uh, our team, our SLT team has been very, very um, purposeful with leaving room for us to have open forums like this. Obviously we've done it via Zoom, um, but even in this setting, we've been able to just, you know, hey, here, uh, here's the statement. Tell me what you think. And thankfully, we've had some really good conversations. We are currently in the midst of a DEI training, um, which has been great thus far. We're two weeks into a seven week training program. Um, so that th those are some of the things that I know that we are doing uh, here at United Way that, that I feel like will continue to welcome and foster conversation. So just, so that way, again, uh, to Dominique's point, it's not just seven weeks and then, okay, you know, let's move on. But hopefully after these seven weeks, we can continue on for the next several years to continue to grow from this experience um, and then take some of these principles we're learning in this training and apply it, not just internally, but externally. Absolutely. It's important that we create initiatives uh, or that we create uh, things within our organization. So it's not just a one-time thing that we focus on 
for uh, you know just a short amount of time, but it needs to be a business imperative. It needs to be a life that lives and breathes throughout your organization all the time. And so I wanna make sure that we get to some of the questions. And Nicole, I see you have a question about the term minority. I don't use the term minority unless I'm talking about a business. Because when you talk about a minority owned business, that is the legal term that they use to talk about businesses. Um, for me, I use the term people of color and women. Because if you look at the definition of minority, a minority is someone who is less than. And I never want to be seen as less than. Um, I feel like I have a voice at the table and we all have a sense of belonging and we all should be there. And so when I am the minority in the group, I'm less than and I'm not. I bring just as much value to the table. Um, so when, when you say minority around me, I, I feel the hairs on my arm you know, kind of go up. And I understand that that's the term we've used for so long, but I want people to start thinking about what it says when you use that phrase. And you're saying that uh, this group of individuals is less than any other group. And, and, and the context of that is they don't bring the same thing to the team. And so I don't like that term, um, minority. Uh, would any of our other panelists like to talk about how they feel about that word? I think for myself, uh, when I have been in opportunities and have been identified as a minority, I just take the, the time to introduce myself. I am Takora Johnson and I identify as a black woman. I don't identify as an African-American woman. I identify as a black American woman. And so I was just taught growing up, it's not what they call you, it's what you respond to. And so I take that opportunity to let them know, you know, this is who I am. Um, and, and I would agree uh, with what they're saying. It's, it's definitely um, that term is, the, like you said, it's, it's for a business, it's how you identify. And I know for myself, I never want to be given anything because of the color of my skin. I want to be given things based off my skill set. And so I think, um, again, agreeing with you on the word minority, but like you said earlier, taking the opportunity to say, hello, and this is who I am. So I just kind of nip it at the bud then. And I think that's, that, that's how those conversations go from uncomfortable to comfortable conversation. Right, absolutely. And so when, for me, when I reference people of color, that includes um, everyone who is not white in, in, in my vocabulary. So um, that includes the Latinx community and it includes um, Asian and, you know, so non-white is what people of color mean to me, even though, because it's not just about the, the skin tone, but it, it's about that inclusion of, of everyone who doesn't fall into what people typically know as the majority, if, if that helps clarify um, for individuals. Uh, Dominique or Tony, did you wanna, wanna touch on that? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. I was just uh, about to unmute to say something. You know, a few minutes ago, I said that, um, all black people are not African American, and, and Takora was just commenting sort of that on how she identifies. Um, I also wanted to make the statement that not everybody who is Latino, Latina, Hispanic, Latinx, however you want to uh, respond to that, right, is Mexican or Guatemalan or Peruvian or Dominican. Uh, I happen to be half Dominican. Uh, we are really very, very diverse. and that is part of what, as a country, we need to understand and not lump everybody into the same category and assume. And please, I, some of my best friends are Mexican and I love Mexican food, but I, I, I have to say it this way because this is something that impacts many, many in the Latinx community. We didn't all grow up eating tortillas and salsa, as wonderful as that is. We had different cultures, different holidays that we celebrate, uh, you know, different ways of speaking the same language as Spanish, you know. In the U.S., we don't speak exactly the way they speak in England. 
Imagine that across all of the Latin American countries plus Spain. It's really varied. So, <laughs> Tony, I like that your wife is Dominican, right? She deals with that, right? Uh, it's just such a reality. Um, we would be so much richer if we embraced that diversity and really looked at each person. So when I hear Takora say, I identify as a black woman, not as an African-American, that makes me want to pick up the phone and call her and say, tell me what you see different there. What, what does that mean to you? Because I think I know something, but I need to know what she thinks. We need to really embrace that difference and that diversity and be enriched by it. I'm preaching too much here. I'm going to stop. No, that's great because that that's what's important in these conversations is is to get rid of all those stereotypes and to educate people about the different terms and the cultures and and so that's why it's important that we talk about it that we learn and grow from it um but i want also want to make sure that you know when we have these conversations it's easy to focus on racial diversity and and i know i am guilty of the racial diversity piece but we want to make sure that we're addressing that this conversation is also about our friends in the LGBTQ community. It's also people with disabilities and veterans. So let's make sure, you know, that we're, we're inclusive of all. That's, I, I want you all to know that we have to make sure that we're embracing everyone in different communities. And Hannah, I know someone um, sent you a question directly. Yes, um, the question was, I would love to know how the panelists might address a workplace that is comfortable taking a stance on racial equity, but will not advocate for LGBTQ plus individuals because they fear disenfranchising investors or members. That's a big one. Anybody on the panel want to try that? So I'll, I'll take us, uh, go ahead, Tony. No, I was just going to ask, could you repeat the question? Yes. Um, I would love to know how the panelists might address a workplace that is com comfortable taking a stance on racial equity, but will not advocate for the LGBTQ plus individuals because they fear disenfranchising investors or members. Mm. Well, for me, you know, and, and I always look at things through a biblical perspective, just because that's who I am. Um, that, that's how I identify. Um, and for me, you know, the principle of love God, love people. If you're a person, you, you are, you are demand, there, there is a demand, there is a command to love you. There is a demand and a command to make sure you have what you need. And so as an organization, um, whether you are a one person organization or a, a thousand member organization, company, whatever, you have a demand to make sure that people in your organization and the people that you serve outside of your organization are, 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 are getting equitable treatment, equitable services, equitable um, um, resources. So that way that need is met. Um, because at the end of the day, we have a responsibility to make sure that we are doing what's right. Um, and so for me, that that, that's my personal stance on that is if, if you are a person, my job is to love you, regardless of what my beliefs may be about whatever, my job is to love you. Um, and so that that's where, you know, I think we need to take it a step further with everything when it comes to um, people not feeling the love or not feeling that they're getting equitable treatment. So I would say a lot of times decisions are made based off of fear. And so education is key. And so finding out what exactly it is that they feel like they can't do or why they can't do it and chopping down each topic one by one. And so finding a solution based off of that fear. So if it's fear of losing members, well, why do you think that you'll lose members? So educating, knowing who, um, who your, your audience is, but also creating uh, an, an answer and a solution to uncover that fear and to address it. Dominique, did you? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, we talk a lot in the U.S. about the cost of freedom and how all the veterans who gave their lives and 
um, and who, who gave up health because some didn't give up their lives, but they have had all kinds of disabilities and, and things. So, so we, we get that concept of the cost of freedom for us in this country, right? We don't have freedom for everybody here yet. We are not going to get there without a cost. So if we are not willing as an organization, as a corporation, as, uh, as a body of, of any kind to pay a price, we cannot get that freedom. So that price may in fact be a loss of membership, may in fact be a loss of donors. That's the truth. But if we are saying that we are committed truly to having real diversity and equity and inclusion, in our business, in our organization, um, in, in, in our house of worship, in whatever, we have to know that it's going to come at a cost. We're mm -hmm. going to have to pay something for it because freedom does not come free. Absolutely. And I know we could have this conversation for hours. Um, and I appreciate, as, as a co-chair of Women United, I appreciate United Way for creating this platform um, where we can start having these discussions and, and being open and honest about it. And I love uh, that all of you have been willing to just be so transparent and be so authentic on this call. And so thank you all to our panelists and thank you all to our guests. And I'm going to drop my email address in the chat. If there are some things that you want to talk to me about directly, I, would, um, I don't mind answering those questions or scheduling some time. But Hannah, I'm going to turn it over to you so that uh, you can wrap us up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dion, and to all of our speakers. Um, I was truly touched by everything that you guys said and learning from your experiences. Um, and then thank you for all of you um, for hopping on this conversation today and putting your input and feedback in the comments and questions. We appreciate it. And we are so happy that you felt comfortable enough to do that. Um, before we wrap up totally, we always like to provide you guys with um, another way to get engaged with United Way. Um, and United Way has the privilege and honor of um, investing dollars into the community every single year. Um, and to do that, we need the community to help us know where we need to allocate those dollars to. And so we need volunteers um, to help us with the grant process and reviewing those grants. And so today we have Sarah Newman, who is the Director of um, Community Investment and Partner Relations here to talk with us um, about a volunteer opportunity. Hi everyone, thank you, Hannah. Um, I, I don't think I could say it better myself and I don't wanna take us over our time. So yes, um, if you are interested in learning more, you can just reach out to me. I know Hannah will include it in the email and um, we can put it in the chat as well. Um, but we definitely need some help our next fiscal cycle and we'd love for you to learn more about the great work happening in our communities and help evaluate those applications that we receive. So. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, and I see a few of you on this call who have helped in the past, and we appreciate that so much. And so if you're wanting to do it again, reach out to Sarah. We can use your help for sure. Um, also, I'm going to be sending out a follow-up email that's going to have a recording of this um, conversation today, information about Women United, and what Sarah just talked about, becoming a community investment volunteer advocate. Um, thanks so much for being with us today and have a great rest of your day. Bye.